Good evening. The 25th shuttle launch ends with an explosion and the loss of seven lives. An expanded edition of Eyewitness News is coming up next. From TV4, WJXT, this is Eyewitness News, the one most people watch. With Tom Wills, Deborah Giannolis, meteorologist George Wendling with weather, Sam Kuvaris with sports, and the Eyewitness News team. It started off as a flawless and routine launch, the countdown and the roar of the rockets that Americans have grown so accustomed to seeing on television and for some in person. In fact, the extraordinary sight had become seemingly so ordinary that three commercial networks no longer go out of their way to provide live liftoff coverage. Such was the case this morning just after 11.30, but then without warning, 75 seconds into the flight, Challenger blew up, taking the lives of seven astronauts, including school teacher Krista McAuliffe. Late this afternoon, the space agency officially confirmed what had been frighteningly apparent from the beginning, that no one had survived. Good evening. Shortly after the accident, NASA closed the Kennedy Space Center in Florida because they wanted to devote their full time and attention to a rescue operation if there was going to be any rescue possible. Then late this afternoon, they reopened the Kennedy Space Center to reporters, and we go there now live to Catherine Smith of the Florida News Network. The launch definitely appeared routine. Sensors on board had picked up no problems. And at this point, the cause of the explosion remains a mystery. Meanwhile, here at the Kennedy Space Center, there is still a feeling of disbelief and great sorrow at the loss of Challenger's seven crew members. Eight, seven, six. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. The liftoff itself appeared picture perfect. As Challenger cleared the tower, Mission Control in Houston took over monitoring of the flight. All systems were performing normally. There were no signs of trouble. Then the flight director gave Challenger's commander the go ahead to throttle the engines to full power. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go at throttle up. Commander Dick Scobie's acknowledgement of the call to throttle up the engines was the last voice contact the ground had with Challenger. The vehicle literally burst into pieces, the solid rocket boosters spiraling away, at least one of them still burning. The explosion at first caught ground crews by surprise. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. After that announcement, it was another 50 seconds before the magnitude of what happened started to no sink doubt. in. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. A rescue team was immediately sent to the area looking for some sign of Challenger and her seven crew members, but rescue efforts were hampered by debris from the explosion. It continued falling into the Atlantic Ocean for almost an hour, posing a threat to rescue workers. Finally, several ships, helicopters, and airplanes made it into the area, which is located about 10 miles off the coast and 25 miles south of the launch pad. Their search was in vain. I regret that I have to report that based on very preliminary searches of the ocean where the Challenger impacted this morning, these searches have not revealed any evidence that the crew of Challenger survived. On board this flight were five professional astronauts, a payload specialist from Hughes Aircraft, and high school teacher Krista McAuliffe. McAuliffe was chosen as the first civilian to fly on the shuttle. Her flight had captured the imagination of hundreds of school children, many of whom were at the Kennedy Space Center to watch the launch. Their excitement quickly turned to tears as they realized just what had happened. Also watching today, Krista McAuliffe's parents, Edward and Grace Corrigan of Boston, Massachusetts. At first, the horror of what they had witnessed just did not sink in. That was the reaction of many who knew McAuliffe. 16-year-old Brian Ballard is the editor of the student newspaper at the high school where McAuliffe taught in Concord, New Hampshire. First, I felt everything was going fine. The explosion, I thought, was just the normal separation between the booster rockets and the orbiter. Uh, suddenly, everything started flying around, and I heard a couple of screams, and I, didn't, I knew that things weren't going right at that point. 
NASA has formed a special review board to look into the explosion. It will take some time before they know just what happened. They may never know. Meanwhile, the flag at the Kennedy Space Center hangs at half-mast in honor of the seven people who lost their lives on board Challenger. After 4.30 this afternoon that NASA officially announced that they believe the crew to all be dead. It was also at that, that, that time that they announced there will be no more shuttle launches here at the Kennedy Space Center until they find out what caused the explosion. Also at this hour, Vice President George Bush, Senators Jake Garn and John Glenn have arrived at the Kennedy Space Center. They are here to publicly offer their condolences to the family of Challenger's seven crew members who lost their lives today in a tragic explosion in the skies above the Kennedy Space Center. Reporting live from the Kennedy Space Center, I'm Katherine Smith. The seven-member crew of the Challenger was distinguished by its school teacher member. The pilots and scientists on board would have remained nameless to most of us. But now all Americans join their seven families in mourning the loss. The crew included three pilots, three scientists, and of course, teacher Krista McCullough, the first citizen in space. The mission was led by 46-year-old Francis Scobie, a native of Washington State and a former Air Force fighter pilot. This was Scobie's second shuttle flight. He is survived by a wife and two children. North Carolina native Mike Smith was the main pilot for the shuttle mission. This would have been the 40-year-old astronaut's first trip to space. He was, by training, a Navy test pilot. He was also married with three children. The veteran woman astronaut on this flight was mission specialist Judy Resnick. The 36-year-old woman made her first flight in 1984. She was the only single member of the mission. Astronaut Ron McNair was also a veteran of space flight following his first mission in 84. A scientist, McNair was a native of South Carolina. He leaves a wife and two children. The third pilot on this mission was Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Ellison Onizuka of Hawaii. The 39-year-old had also been in space at least once before. He is survived by a wife and two children. Mission Specialist Gregory Jarvis was a Hughes Aircraft Company engineer. The 41-year-old was a former satellite engineer and was aboard Challenger to conduct tests on the effects of weightlessness. He was married. 37-year-old high school teacher Krista McAuliffe was selected from a field of more than 11,000 teachers who competed in NASA's first citizen in space competition. The New Hampshire teacher was married with two children. Several people here at Eyewitness News this morning were following the launch. They were watching it on a satellite broadcast provided by the space agency NASA. And as soon as the explosion occurred, reporter Winston Dean and photographer Joe Bernsted were sent to the Cape. As Tom told you earlier, reporters were not allowed at the Space Center immediately following the explosion. And so Joe and Winston took some time to talk to people at Merritt Island, and then later they were allowed onto the Space Center. Winston now is joining us live. Winston? Right now, obviously, uh, the country is experiencing the aftershock of this tragedy, but more so the outlying areas in and around the Kennedy Space Center, Merritt Island, as you mentioned, uh, as well as uh, uh, Cocoa Beach and Titusville. Uh, one person uh, among many in this area watched literally from their backyards these routine flights of the shuttle. And one person told me today that with all the uh, glitches that seem to have occurred before this launch, all the various delays that preceded this, this tragedy, that it was almost as if there was a premonition suddenly fulfilled, that it was as if uh, someone was trying to tell us. I later spoke to a uh, worker, a NASA worker here who had just gotten off work, a clerical worker who had gone out with a number of her co-workers to view the, uh, the shuttle as it went up. It looked fine, came down. No one really knew what to think, only that something had gone awry. They then went back in and, of course, watched the various uh, coverage from the various networks. And, uh, and ultimately found out what had happened. And of course, at this point, the various postmortems, the speculation is still coming in as to what perhaps went wrong. At this point, NASA has promised a very thorough and deliberate and long investigation, which is very likely to take months. I'm Winston Dean reporting live. S -s Standing here now with me is Philip Gross, Channel 4's uh, science analyst, who is here to chat with us now a few, a few moments about what this is likely to mean to the space program. Okay, Phil, what does this mean in a nutshell? Well, in a nutshell, it means a major delay for the entire shuttle program. An investigation is going to take several months, and if they hold to their current word that indeed they're not going to launch any shuttles until that investigation is completed and they have found out what went wrong here and made those changes so it won't happen again, it could could mean that we could have many, many months until we have another shuttle launch. And that's going to back up the entire shuttle system. For instance, on March 6th, there was a planned launch of the... Uh, Thank you, Phil. Let I'm me sorry. bust in here. At any rate, as Phil has just said, yes, the speculation will continue. A deliberate investigation will continue from here on out. I'm Winston Dean. Back to you, Deborah and Tom. Thank you, Winston. Of course, that's Winston Dean and Philip Gross at the Kennedy Space Center. Tom. 
A feeling of disbelief over such a disaster is the reaction that is being heard tonight from most people. Among them, a Jacksonville man who had been a finalist in the Teacher in Space contest. Fletcher High School's Mike Reynolds expressed shock and despair when he learned of the accident. Eyewitness News reporter Marianne Christensen spent the afternoon in Reynolds' science class where he discussed the tragedy with his students. Mike Reynolds was teaching class for the first time this week. He missed yesterday after spending it at the Cape waiting to see the shuttle launch. But when it didn't, he returned home, never to expect tragedy a day later. What happened? Did we become, you know, we were, we were just talking about becoming too cocky. Well, we've talked about that. that we, you know, will we as a nation become so cocky that we'll make a mistake? And is that what has happened? Have we, did we become so, did we press so hard and try to get that thing off the ground? So we went off the ground so much that we became cocky in what we could do. What happened today doesn't make sense to anyone at any age, but it is without question clear that Reynolds came very close to being on what became today's fatal flight. Well, I'm going to tell you something, guys. I've never seen so many hugs I've gotten in my life. I mean, everybody, teachers, everybody is saying that. People that don't And I came closer than I think that I, than I had told you. I came much closer as I talked to NASA people than I had thought. I would go if I had a chance. I have other people tell me differently now, but... I would go. We well, you know, we want you to go, but we don't want anything well, the like thing this is, to happen. This, point. this country may have just ungracefully bowed completely out of the space program. It'll be interesting to see what happens over the next few years. And you know, after the Apollo One fire in 1967, um, the U.S. took a long, hard look at the Apollo program and what we should do and how to re redesign the spacecraft. And we thought we had learned from those mistakes. And we've often taken time to, to kid about the Russians and their lack or apparent lack of safety and that sort of thing. Then we have you know, a major catastrophe like this. Reynolds first learned of the tragedy while he was giving a speech to the PTA presidents at the Duval County School Board. He says his first thoughts were that it was a nightmare and that it couldn't be happening. Reynolds' wife, Debbie, echoed those thoughts. I'm just, I'm really shocked that, it, that this happened, and I'm just thankful. I know it was God's plan that Mike not be there for the teacher in space. I was real disappointed that he wasn't going to be yesterday when we were out there, you know, and I know what he was feeling. He would love to be there, but then this morning I was out, I was watching it, and I didn't even realize what happened until I came back in and saw it on TV, and I was just... I mean, I was thankful that he wasn't on there. What started out as an innocent experience for Mike Reynolds has ended in a way no one thought possible, a lesson in life that even a teacher cannot explain. Marianne Christensen, Channel 4 Eyewitness News. Mike Reynolds will be joining us live later in this expanded edition of Eyewitness News to talk about his experiences as an astronaut applicant in light of what happened today. Deborah. Relatives of the shuttle crew members are still in a state of disbelief. A cousin of pilot Mike Smith told a North Carolina reporter today the astronaut had only pride in his accomplishments, as did his whole family. We were just all so proud of him. He wanted all his life. Five years he trained for this. And uh, when you found out today, what was your... Just total disbelief, shock. You know, it had been delayed so many times, and then for this to happen. This would have been Smith's first trip to space. Tom. While the friends and relatives of these seven astronauts must now somehow deal with the tragedy of today, relatives of a Jacksonville astronaut were also hard hit by this morning's accident. Dr. Norman Thaggard first went into space aboard Challenger in June of 83 with America's first woman in space, Sally Ride. A second trip aboard the Challenger left Thaggard eager for a third, and he had been scheduled to go up again May 20th. But today's explosion has left his Jacksonville aunt and uncle just as eager for their nephew to quit the program altogether. That's a terrible thing, especially when you got someone involved with it, you know, like we do. It's, uh, and since he was named after me, that uh, very upsetting, very. I'm sure he's devastated because he knew everybody that was on the, uh, in the program. I don't really don't know how he feels, but I kind of hope he gives a few thoughts about leaving the program. Well, they want him to quit. The Thaggards say if Norman does decide to go up again, they will support his decision, and they will travel to the Cape again for the launch, but with their fingers more firmly crossed than ever. 
Well, all this happened this morning. Governor Bob Graham happened to be flying from Tallahassee to Jacksonville for a campaign appearance. He witnessed the launch attempt from the window of his airplane, but at the same time, he had no idea just what it was that he was witnessing. The governor was talking with Eyewitness News reporter Michael Dillon about the kickoff of Graham's campaign for the Senate. They were interrupted by the plane's pilot who said over the loudspeaker that his passengers could look out the window and see the spaceship taking off. Graham did not realize at the time the Challenger had exploded. Later, when his plane landed, he said he was horrified after being told about today's disaster. We had uh, the opportunity to experience exhilaration of what we thought was going to be another American triumph in space, and we have just learned uh, how fragile uh, that experience is. Uh, it's a tremendous uh, uh, tragedy for th the seven families uh, that uh, have lost uh, a loved one. It's a, uh, a great uh, sorrow that all Americans will feel. At first, Graham told reporters he would continue on with today's schedule of campaign appearance, this, appearances. This was to be the official start of his challenge of Senator Paula Hawkins. The governor later reconsidered and has canceled all of his political activities, not only for today, but indefinitely. Later in the broadcast, Michael Dillon will have more on the governor's campaign. Deborah. President Reagan ended an Oval Office meeting with top aides when he learned of the disaster. He later postponed the State of the Union speech he had planned to deliver later tonight. Instead, he spoke on national TV about an hour ago, saying he and Nancy were pained to the core by today's events. Tonight at 10 o'clock, the president will again address the nation about the shuttle tragedy. Vice President Bush has gone to the Kennedy Space Center to convey the administration's sympathies to the astronauts' families. Throughout Capitol Hill, there is grief. Eyewitness News Washington correspondent Tom Walker has more. Capitol Hill was stunned by such a tragedy in a program so popular and successful. Well, it's very difficult for me to talk about it because these were my friends. Jake Garn of Utah had been the first member of Congress to ride the shuttle. I would go again tomorrow. If, if NASA would let me go, I would go again. Bill Nelson of Florida had flown more recently. This system is not without risk. And everyone who climbs on one of those loaded spaceships understands that risk. The news brought routine business in the House to a halt. The President's State of the Union address just hours away was called off. The questions began. Was the shuttle program pushing ahead too quickly? Certainly there, there was a haste associated with this one uh, that has uh, all of us uh, kind of... Uh, taking a second look uh, at this point. But there's one thing NASA has not done all the way through. Uh, it is uh, take a chance on cutting corners. One estimate here is that the shuttle program could be grounded as long as a year, with an impact on the entire space program, perhaps even military initiatives such as Star Wars. But as one member of Congress put it, it is too soon for questions. It is time now to mourn. Tom Walker, Channel 4 Eyewitness News, Washington. The worst of the January 1986 chill is over. Record low temperatures moved into the area overnight, and freezing weather is expected again tonight. Eyewitness News reporter Nancy Rubin went out into the weather today and found we survived this freeze better than we have past chills. It wasn't the coldest it's ever been here, but it was the coldest January 28th on record, and the mid-teen low this morning was the coldest it's been in more than a year. And while that meant winter gear was the style for downtown workers today, last night, aside from some momentary outages, the Jacksonville Electric Authority said it kept all its customers warm to the tune of a record electrical output. No load problems as such to the point that we could not, did not have generation enough. It was nothing but system problems brought on by the high winds. And hopefully, while your heat was on, your pets and plants and other loved ones were inside enjoying it since this freeze came with an early warning, unlike past freezes. We're in better shape than uh, we were in in uh, 1985, 1983. We had advanced warning. We didn't in 83 because it happened on Christmas Eve. If your car was one of the many around town that refused to start because of this morning's cold, you may have thought that was the traffic delay of the day. But rush hour traffic here at the Fuller Warren Bridge felt the chill as well. The cold in there? Morning, but I'm beginning, I took my gloves off and been beginning to shed my clothes down. The cars backed up as the toll takers tried to warm up. The bridge's electrical generator conked out just about the time rush hour started. 
and toll managers blame those little electric heaters the workers use for overloading the system. The toll takers took turns going into the office for coffee and warmth. As a result, it was slow going at the bridge until well after noon. The repairman here says things should go okay for tomorrow, though, when the thermometer isn't expected to go as low. But keep those coats and scarves coming. At 22 degrees, they'll come in handy. Nancy Rubin, Channel 4, Eyewitness News. Nurserymen in North Florida and all across the state are now bracing for another night of frigid temperatures while still thawing out from what happened last night. The thermometer dipped to 18 degrees at Julian's Nursery in St. John's County. And like most commercial growers and dealers, Julian Goad covered his 30,000 or so plants with a blanket of ice to protect them from the coldest air. The shield of ice holds the temperature to around 32 degrees. But despite that effort, some greenery did not make it. But Goad says it was not enough to affect his prices, at least not at this point. Probably hold pretty stable. I would think that the plant should remain about the same. It's, of course, hurt some of them. The price will go up some. Temperatures are not expected to go as low tonight, but most nurseries will take the same precautions to protect as many of their plants as they can. In people's yards as well, this deep freeze was not as destructive as the one last January, nor the one at Christmas time in 1984. George is joining us now with more on the subject. George? Well, Tom, an important point to be made, ice does not protect the plants from freezing. The key to it is keeping water on the ice. As long as the water is running on the ice, the temperature doesn't drop below 32 degrees. But if that water goes off, that ice will get down below freezing and will freeze the plant. Well, there were many record low temperatures across the eastern part of the country this morning. In fact, we see it was down to two below zero for a record in Asheville, record set in Raleigh, Columbia, Augusta, Charleston, over in Columbus, Georgia, and even in Savannah, it was down to 13, which was the same as Tallahassee. Of course, our temperatures were in the teens here in our area with a record 16 in Jacksonville. It's 26 in Orlando and in Tampa, and even down in Miami Beach, they had a record low of 38. Fort Myers was one degree below the freezing mark this morning with 31 degrees. We didn't get a blanket of clouds over us and that wind continued to pour out of the north during the night last night and that's what caused it to be so clear and cold. As we put the satellite pictures into motion, we see another patch of clouds that's moving into the southeastern states during the afternoon hours, but uh, they are connected with a new low called the Alberta Clipper that's spreading snow across the Ohio Valley, the Great Lakes, and headed toward the northeast. Meanwhile, the jet stream continues to dip southward and looks Looks like we're in for another freezing night here. The temperature will go down to freezing about two hours from now around our Jacksonville area. I'll be back with more on that with our complete weather report. Deborah? Thank you, George. Of course, we are on for an hour tonight, which is the reason that George will be back with more a little bit later on. Last night's freeze made for a perfect experiment at the University of Florida. For the past three years, fruit crop specialists at the university have been trying to save citrus trees from devastating freezes. Last night, they wrapped the plants and then packed them in ice. The result is an ice cake forms on the young tree and the temperatures will not fall, fall far below 32 degrees Fahrenheit and thereby saving the, the trunk and the upper portion of the young tree. We found that we can protect trees, as you've seen out here, down to 9 degrees. That's what we had last year with 20 mile an hour winds and we're seeing the same kind of success this year. These kinds of experiments are already being put into practice around the state. University professors say this method could one day wind up saving the state's billion dollar citrus industry. In a moment, the launch of a campaign is aborted by the launch tragedy at the Cape. That story is next. It was supposed to have been an upbeat day for Florida's number one citizen. Governor Bob Graham's staff, after months of buildup, had selected January 28th as the day he would officially announce his candidacy for the U.S. Senate. Reporter Michael Dillon was with the governor today for that announcement, and later aboard the campaign plane, their interview was interrupted as they watched the shuttle's launch, unaware of the tragedy that had unfolded. It was an icy moon setting above Tallahassee as the state capitol came to life this morning with shivering temperatures. The governor was upbeat as he left his Tallahassee mansion shortly before 8 o'clock for the short drive to the Capitol building. He selected the state Senate chambers where he had served to make the announcement that he would indeed oppose Paula Hawkins for her U.S. Senate seat. We will fight for our future and we will win. With the applause still ringing in his ears, it was then on for what was supposed to be a hopscotch campaign tour around the state. First stop, Jacksonville. But on the way over Lake City, Florida, our interview with Graham was interrupted. 
Our video picks up after the explosion, and perhaps because of the distance, Graham, his staff, the reporters on board were unaware the shuttle had actually exploded. Where else can you get interrupted by the space shuttle, Governor? There are a lot of things that are happening with an intensity and urgency in Florida, unlike any place else in the country. And one of those things is space and the commercialization of space and what that will mean. Ironically, Graham's plane then landed at the wrong Jacksonville airport and had to take off again for a short flight across town. It was only then that the governor and the reporters on board learned of the news. I've just uh, heard the tragic news that uh, we had uh, the opportunity to experience exhilaration of what we thought was going to be another American triumph in space, and we have just learned uh, how fragile uh, that experience is. Initially, Graham decided to proceed with his first campaign stop, meeting with employees of a communications firm in Jacksonville. But with the shock of the tragedy setting in, his campaign schedule was postponed indefinitely, and Graham ordered that flags throughout the state be lowered to half staff. It was supposed to be a gala kickoff for Bob Graham's Senate campaign, extolling all that is good about his state. Instead, that's all been obscured, and January 28th will now certainly go down as one of the most tragic days in the history of Florida. Michael Dillon, Channel 4 Eyewitness News. The Jacksonville Electric Authority today made the final selection on which companies will supply coal for its new coal-fired generating plant. It is considered to be the most expensive purchasing decision the JEA board members have ever made. The total cost of operating the plant is expected to be more than $1.6 billion over the next 10 years. Today, the JEA voted on giving the lucrative contracts to three suppliers, Shamrock Coal, Ashland Coal, and Intercore, a division of Exxon. The three companies were picked so the JEA would not be dependent on one supplier of coal. Bids submitted by the companies wanting to sell $850,000 worth of radio equipment to the school board were open today, despite some objections that have been raised about the size of the radio system. School board member Stan Jordan and the city's purchasing division have questioned whether the school system needs a sophisticated 10-channel setup to equip school buses with emergency radios. The city communications department, which recommended the system, has declined to explore other options. Once the low bid is chosen in a couple of days, it will then be up to the school board to decide whether to go ahead with the recommended system or do something else. Deborah? Investigators think an electrical short and a computer counter is to blame for an early morning bank fire. Firefighters were called to the blaze at the Roosevelt branch of the Barnett Bank just before 3 this morning. No one was injured in the fire. Damage estimates are running around $60,000. The bank is not expected to reopen until next week. None of the money was ever threatened because it is stored in fireproof safes. There are five new faces seeking fame in a Canton, Ohio hall. Rick Carley will tell us about that and the uproar over FSU's basketball coach when we come back. If you're just turning on your television set and expecting to see Dan Rather, you will be seeing Dan Rather coming up at 7 o'clock tonight. We have expanded Eyewitness News to an hour this evening to, of course, bring you coverage of the Challenger disaster down at Cape Canaveral this morning. Let's go now to Rick Carley, who, uh, you got a pretty big story coming out of Tallahassee, huh? Joe Williams, he's been there since 1978, eighth year at FSU, decides to resign. Now, I don't know if he decided, mm -hmm. or the alumni and the officials decided, there's going to be a press conference held tomorrow. In mid-season, he's leaving. In mid-season, well, not really. He's, no? he's announced he will stay until the end of the season. Oh, and, uh, so he's a lame duck for the remainder of the yeah, season. Yeah, but the thing is, he won't talk. He won't talk to anybody. He won't talk to the newspaper. He's talking to the Tallahassee Democrat, sports writer mm -hmm. who has apparently had this thing set up for about two weeks. That's all he'll talk to. And that's when he, he told that reporter? It, it, apparently. Well, maybe it's the five-game losing streak. Maybe it's the 7-10 and ten record, including seven straight road losses recently. But we don't know uh, what Joe Williams' exact feelings are until he holds that news conference tomorrow over in Tallahassee. But the point is, Williams resigned this afternoon as the Knowles head coach effective at the end of this season. In fact, it was just a week ago over in Tally that Williams' team lost to Southern Mississippi. The next game, they lost to Miami. They really should have beat that team. Williams is 51 years old. He's had success wherever he's been. In fact, all three of his teams he's coached has gone out of the NCAA tournament to see action. This season, Williams just apparently hasn't had the luck that he's had with previous ball clubs. In fact, a few of his records, while at JU back in the late 60s, early 70s, remember, took Artis Gilmore and JU to the NCAA title game against UCLA, then went to Furman from 70 to 78, successful there too, 142 and 87 record. Then in 78, went to Tallahassee, his record there, 124 and 98. This year, kind of a mediocre 7 and 10 record. 
Well, you hear his name and you figure he's a Canadian hockey star primed for the NHL. But Pat Laguerre is a freshman point guard for JU. Last night he scores 11 points. He whips the Dolphins back into shape against South Alabama. You know, I was a little nervous when I got in, but as the game flowed on, I felt a little better. And I was a, I, I'm um, very confident in my abilities. And as the game grew on, I forget, kept getting more and more confident. He sure did. JU down by 9, 14 left. But that's when Laguerre went to the point. Murphy opened up his game, 26 points. Then Otis Smith hit the basket that made the difference. 57 all, three minutes left. He hits that baby from five feet off the drive. It's JU by two. Then Ronnie came back down the court. He put one in from 18 feet from the baseline. It's JU by four, the final 64-61. I think it, it was, I was in my rhythm, you know. In, in the past, you get in the rhythm, you can shoot the open shot. And I just was in my rhythm. When the shots came to him, I just hit him. Our next, our next trip is uh, Western Kentucky and UAB. We're on the road again. Willie Nelson's our theme song. All right, last night in Gainesville, the Gators playing for the second time in three days. Florida, no problems, however. They dust off Miami, 75-53 the finals. They jumped out uh, to 10-7 and seven with the win. Moten with 18 points, two here on the inside move. The high score for Florida, again, who else? Vernon Maxwell, he had 20 points. Kenny McClary played a good game inside the hoop here. And you wonder where Sam is. He was at the game last night, complete with headbands, with Ray-bands, the whole bit. Sunglasses anyway. Joe Lawrence hits from the baseline. The Gators beat Miami by 20. Two, avoiding a possible letdown at the Odo. I was afraid some of our guys would say, well, we won by 17 down there, and we're now at home, and it shouldn't be too much difficulty, and I knew better than that. So I was very pleased and very proud of our ball club, the way they went out and went to work right from the opening tip and maintained their concentration and intensity throughout the entire 40 minutes. That's Norm Sloan at the Gators. Well, the FJC basketball team is something in common with the Gators football team. Their reign at the top spot in the state and the country, for that matter, is short-lived just a few hours after learning their number one in the state's junior college poll. The Stars went out, lost last night to Lake City Community College, the final 73-72. They're still 18-4, and four, but... The Stars' 13-game win streak has come to an end. Well, guess who is in town today over at Hidden Hills Country hey, Club in Jacksonville? Well, none other than Arnold Palmer. In town to look over the course. He's in the process of revamping the existing course. He's also adding on another nine holes out at Hidden Hills. He says today he doesn't force his course designs on any one country club. One of the things that we try not to do is trademark our golf courses. Uh, we try to develop and build golf courses that will suit the area that we are building the golf course in, number one, and to answer the desires uh, that the landowner or the developer of that uh, property is looking for. All right, we'll add another five NFL greats to the Football Hall of Fame. And Canton Fran Tarkenton, the quarterback, leads that list that was voted in this morning. Joining Fran are Paul Horning of the Packers, the Golden Boy, Ken Houston, a defensive back, Doak Walker, and Willie Lanier, formerly of the Chiefs, fouling to make the cut today were quarterback Len Dawson and Don Maynard, the former Jets receiver. Well, the New Orleans Saints made it official this afternoon. They've hired Jim Mora, the former coach of this team, the Baltimore Stars, as their coach down in New Orleans. Moore has been hired as the head honcho. He'll try to do something seven others have been unable to do, and that's, well, show up with a winning record come the end of the NFL season. Elsewhere may make you wonder. Well, it may make you not wonder because we're not going to get to the tape. But uh, we're talking about Fred Bullard last night, and it makes you wonder about the Denver uh, Bulls merger. Yeah. Doug Spedding in town and everything. Uh, Fred Bullard tells Sam last night that uh, if they do merge, he doesn't know if he's going to be the loan owner, a mm -hmm. uh, general partner, what's going to happen. So a lot of action taking place in the USFL this February. But no announcements yet. Exactly. Nothing. Thank you, Rick. All right. Deborah. Tonight won't be as frigid as last night, but Jack Frost will still feel mighty comfortable around here. Georgia's forecast is coming up. As you might expect, there has been a growing crescendo of complaints about our frigid temperatures. Some people are even yearning for a return to the warm days of summer. Well, if you're one of those longing to get out of the sweaters and back into the shorts, Eyewitness News reporter Robin Saran reminds us of what it's like in Jacksonville in July. Employees at the Basso Chemical Company bundled up today. Gloves, hats, and heavy jackets are a necessity when you have to work outside. Quite a contrast to the sweltering temperatures seven months ago that caused a worker at the same plant to pass out from heat exhaustion. And whether hot or cold, the workload never lets up for Pete Sorensen. Here he is fixing the heater in this dance studio so the cold won't force classes to be closed. Sorensen had to make a trip to the same exact place last summer to fix the air conditioner. 
He's not sure which is worse, sweating or shivering. Last time you come by, I was about to burn up, and this time I'm about to freeze to death. The owners of this chocolate shop know they prefer the chilly weather. In July, a faulty air conditioner meant melted candy. Today, the problem was frozen pipes, but that's okay with the people who work here. They say the colder it gets, the more people buy up chocolate. There's a, probably a third more increase in business. More people buy chocolate because it gives you the energy to burn off the cold weather. Businesses that thrive on cooling you off naturally do well in the summer. There's been a sharp increase in business since Friday. Um, our sales probably doubled over the last weekend. Today, the ceiling fan shop is out of business. A computer store moved in. Whether temperatures reach extreme highs in the summer or extreme lows in the winter, there's one thing the JEA says you can count on. Using more air conditioning or heat will mean your electric bill will also be extreme. Robin Saran, Channel 4 Eyewitness News. Of course, the moral of that story is you just can't please all the people all the time, and nobody knows that better than George. Oh, you have to answer all those phone calls, hot weather, cold weather. Some people were really wishing that we had some more snow today, and <laughs> we could, uh, you know. I wasn't one of them, I can uh, assure you. You were dreaming of a white January. I was so happy to see blue sky. <laughs> <laughs> well, the sun wasn't doing much today, Deborah. Uh, this is one of those cold snaps. Fortunately, not as bad as the two previous winters. Five degrees makes a world of difference, especially since the plants that get killed with temperatures as low as we had last night aren't around anymore. And the uh, reason for such cold is the Siberian Express, which you have been hearing of. Siberian Express is not the Alberta Clipper. The Alberta Clipper is a low pressure. The Siberian Express is high pressure, high, heavy, dry air that comes down out of Canada. And as we see how it moves, we see that it gradually progresses across the country with a clockwise circulation preceded by the northerly winds. And those winds died down during the night uh, tonight and we'll be seeing frost and freezing temperatures for one more night. The jet stream continues to feed an Alberta clipper. That's the low pressure that's moving toward the Great Lakes at this hour. Well, currently in Jacksonville, with a chill still in the air, our temperature is just creeping back into the 30s after going up to a high of 42. That followed the morning low of 16 degrees. Humidity now 26%, the barometer 30.20, and on the rise, winds not as strong as they were last night this time, now at 7 miles per hour. Air quality in the good range, 31, with total suspended particulates or dust in the air. Well, the high pressure is settling over us, and near the high pressure center is where the winds are calm, except for, of course, breezes blowing because of the warm waters near the coast. Meanwhile, the main circulation, though, brought the cold temperatures and held the high temperature down to only 21 in Asheville, 35 in Atlanta, 39 was a high this afternoon in Brunswick, but it was only 45 in Orlando around Disney World, a cold day in Miami with a high of only 54. There were some record temperatures, though, out west where winds were from the south, 71 in Pueblo, Colorado, and 60 in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, the temperatures around the western states, as Weather Center 4 computer looks at the high temperatures today, we see 79 down in Los Angeles, 64 in Denver, but along the Canadian border, on the other side of the cold fronts, 29 in Bismarck, 13 in Minneapolis, 16 in Chicago, with snows up in the northern plains coming down, and this clipper will be moving rapidly eastward over the next day or so, but we'll continue under this high pressure. The northeast temperatures still below freezing in the 20s in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware, down to the nation's capital, and to uh, the North Carolina mountains. Well, the forecast lows for tonight, not quite as cold as last night, but nevertheless a freeze down to about the Ocala, uh, Daytona Beach area, 30s all the way down to West Palm Beach and Fort Myers with frost under that high pressure during the night tonight. Around our particular area, temperatures will be mostly in the middle 20s with not so much wind, not as hard a freeze, but nevertheless uh, freezing 12 to 14 hours. Along our coastal section, the winds will be mostly out of the southwest. Now be starting a warming trend during the day tomorrow. And on our forecast maps, we see what effect that will have on us. Uh, the high pressure with less wind will be bringing mild air coming as the Alberta Clipper moves eastward bringing snow to the northeastern states tomorrow. And this mild weather will be accompanied by possibly some showers, as we see on the four-day forecast, but not until we get toward the weekend. Low temperature tonight of 23, tomorrow night 33, Friday morning about 38, and on Saturday a cool day, but not extremely cold, with a high of 65. Tonight freezing from 8.30 until 9.30 in the morning. The low, mostly sunny skies, not so cold. A low of 23 in the colder locations, High temperature of 57. Huh, 57. So, <laughs> anytime you have a high of only 42 yesterday, that's too cold. That certainly or is. Or today, rather. Thank you, George. Ahead on Eyewitness News, continued coverage of the shuttle disaster. Stay tuned.
With the clear sky this morning, the shuttle launch and subsequent disaster were visible to anyone here in Jacksonville who looked to the southeast. At the time of the blast off, an employee at the city's public television station, WJCT Channel 7, happened to be testing a camera. The photographer noticed the shuttle overhead and turned his camera up to get a picture of the launch just as the rocket exploded. We have slowed the tape down some for a better look at the explosion as it could be seen from Metropolitan Park. People who are used to watching shuttle takeoffs knew almost right away this one was in trouble. Almost from the start, the trail of Challenger smoke didn't look quite right. What you're seeing now is a picture of today's liftoff alongside the picture of another Challenger launch, this one last fall. And it has cleared the tower. Roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines beginning throttling down now at 94%. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104%. We'll throttle down to uh, 65% shortly. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. As you could see from the clock, the explosion blew apart the shuttle just a minute, 15 seconds into its flight. The horror of today's shuttle explosion was felt throughout the country, but in a few cities, it really hit home. In Palmdale, California, workers at Rockwell International who helped to build the shuttle were stunned. CBS reporter Jerry Bowen has more. This is where the Challenger was built, Rockwell International in the Mojave Desert at Palmdale, California. Over the lunch hour today, the people who had put the Challenger together sat in stunned disbelief as they watched their spaceship on the videotape replays, exploding over and over again. When the word started coming out, people were really down. Emotions were few people around the plant crying. Um, people just felt really bad because of something they, you know, they built and they really um, were happy to see it go and stuff and when that came around they everybody was really down about it and i feel sorry for uh, all the things that happened over there and I'd like to um tell the families and everybody else how sorry we are crushed it's very hard to understand that you work on something and have so much pride and know that it happened and that there's nothing really you can do but just the pride of knowing that you worked on it. Sorrow, wounded pride, utter helplessness. The feelings of the space age workers who helped the Challenger rise from the California desert. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Los Angeles. Joining us now here in the studio is the man who by now has become pretty well known as the Jacksonville teacher who wanted to be on this flight, Mike Reynolds of Fletcher High School. Mike, welcome. You know, for those of us who've had an opportunity to actually see a launch of the space shuttle, when you see it on TV, it's exciting, but when you're there, that exhilaration takes over. That's so true. But you never stop looking at the sky because in the back of your mind, you know this can happen. How aware were you and all the other teacher applicants of the tremendous risk involved in this? I think with any new frontier, you always know there is a risk involved, and I think that's so true here. I think that as I've gone down and seen so many launches, 20 of the 25 shuttle launches, that that's always in the back of my mind. Is something going to happen? I always save a, uh, save a few frames of my camera just in case. And you always mm -hmm. hope that just in case never happens, but unfortunately today it did. Mike, I was reading an interview uh, with you and with your wife in the newspaper this morning right after I saw what had happened down there. And your wife was quoted as saying that when you were not chosen to be on this flight, she was disappointed and yet relieved. Now, obviously, when she said that to the newspaper, she could not ever have realized how prophetic those words were in light of today. That's so true. You know, again, I think whenever you're in any sort of business where you're pushing into a new frontier, there's always risks. And this is one where the risks were there, and obviously, uh, the most horrible thing has happened, and that's, of course, the destruction of Challenger and the seven precious lives on board. Sure. You know, Mike, there's been a lot of hindsight today, obviously, and we've heard people say, 
There should never have been a citizen in space. Congressmen should not have been flying on that space shuttle. This is an experimental program. We weren't ready to have citizens in space yet. How do you react to that? Well, I think there's both pros and cons to that. The program looked so successful. We had built-in redundancies and backups and fail-safes. This should have never happened. And I think that's the reason NASA's scratching her head and saying, why? What could have gone wrong? Because mm -hmm. we had a vehicle that had backups. We should have known there was a problem. And it didn't happen. We didn't. We had no indication all there was a problem. I think that citizen involvement, senatorial involvement is important because, again, we're the ones, teachers, et cetera, that are going to bring back the message to the, tomorrow's future, the students in the classroom. In the applying and uh, almost the training procedures that you went through before the final decision was made, was there ever any discussion of the dangers? I mean, in any flight, the most dangerous part is takeoff and landing, and that is certainly true, obviously, when you're going all the way into space. Was there ever any discussion or any, uh, any thought or any suggestion to you that, you know, this, this could be very dangerous? Uh, this is true. Yeah, there was quite a bit of discussion along this line. But mm -hmm. again, I think that most of us viewed it that it was safer than flying on an airplane. Mm -hmm. And again, when something like this happens, you look and you say, thank goodness, you know, it was a later jet I was going to catch. And this is what's happened here. The president said today that as sad as this is, it is a part of discovery and of exploration. Right. Do you feel that way? That's very true. We've got to press on. And this is, going to be, this is going to be an indication of how strong this country is because if we can now pick up a horrible mess, a, a catastrophe, and move on, that's an indication of how strong we are. That's going to be the, the interesting thing, see what happens over the next few months and years. Thank you so much, Mike, Thank for you. joining us. Mike Reynolds, who could have been a teacher in space and may yet be. You never know. I, th I take it you're still willing to go. I would still like to do it. Thank you, Mike. We're awful Thank glad you. you're here with us tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to be here. Of course, this has been a day-long day of disbelief. All those who witnessed the tragic fate of the shuttle Challenger and its crew could barely believe their eyes this morning. The emotions have been strong for everyone, especially those connected with the space program in any way. Reporting for CBS, Rob Armstrong has more on that. Liftoff of the 25th it looked space like a picture-perfect liftoff. After days of frustrating delays, the Space Shuttle Challenger and with it Krista McCulloch, the country's first civilian teacher in space, was off the launch pad. But less than a minute and a half into the mission, tragedy etched itself across the Florida sky. After 56 manned space flights without a loss of life in flight, there was no doubt that the grim reality was seven Americans had perished. Ed and Grace Corrigan, Krista McAuliffe's parents, were among the people who watched at Cape Canaveral, not quite able to believe what they were seeing, certainly not wanting to believe it. Senator John Glenn, the first American astronaut to orbit the Earth, said the specter of what happened has haunted the space program since it began. That's it. You say this is a day we've managed to avoid for a quarter of a century. You say we've talked about before and speculated on, and uh, it finally has arrived. We hope we could push this day back forever. And Senator Jake Garn, who flew aboard a shuttle himself last year, said he feels like he's lost members of his own family. Mike Smith, the uh, pilot, was my mother hen the first month that I trained. They assigned him to me, go to my classes and help uh, brief me. And I don't know of any time that I have been more shocked or more moved than when my first wife was killed in an automobile accident. And so it's been uh, very, very difficult for me this morning. In Concord, New Hampshire, students at the school where Krista McAuliffe taught cheered the launch. And then they were stunned into absolute silence by the disaster they had just witnessed. America lost three Apollo astronauts in a fire on the ground in 1967. Today, seven perished in the sky. Mission Commander Francis Scobie. Co-pilot Michael Smith. Astronaut Judith Resnick. Astronaut Ronald McNair. Astronaut Ellison Onizuka. Satellite engineer Gregory Jarvis. Teacher Krista McAuliffe. This was the worst day in the history of the American space program. The investigation into exactly what happened, the analysis of all the data could take weeks or months. One thing is certain, no more Americans will be launched into space until the exact cause of today's tragedy has been determined. Rob Armstrong, CBS News, New York. That's our report for now. A reminder that President Reagan will address the nation for a second time today on this disaster tonight at 10 o'clock.
I'm Tom Wills. And I'm Deborah Giannolis. We'll be back again at 11 o'clock. Entertainment tonight will not be seen this evening so that we can continue our coverage of this story. Stay tuned for the CBS Evening News and Dan Rather. Good night.